thank you, Corrine, uh, for inviting me here today. And thank you for that um, excellent introduction. You have made my life much easier this evening because you framed the issues so well. You know, all of you read the newspapers and all of you are aware of the number of very high profile corruption cases that have been publicized. And they have justifiably generated incredible moral outrage. But as important as this moral dimension is, and I don't want to understate it, this evening I am going to focus on the broader social, economic, and political dimension of this disease. And explain why this has become such an important issue for economic organizations like the IMF. A word about the IMF. Um, Corrine gave a very helpful introduction. As she indicated, it was set up at the end of the Second World War. And the rationale for its creation is particularly relevant today. The rationale was that economic nationalism undermines world peace. That was the lesson learned from what happened in the 30s. And that in order to reduce the risk of economic nationalism and chaos, we needed to create a framework for international economic cooperation. And what is really quite extraordinary about the architecture that was established at the end of the war was not just that these countries created treaty obligations on cooperation, but they actually also established an independent institution that was charged with monitoring performance of those obligations. And this institution, the IMF, was set up to do essentially two things. One of them, it was given regulatory authority to make an assessment as to whether countries' economic policies were giving rise to risks of instability and to publish those assessments. But secondly, if a crisis did arise, the IMF had the financial resources to help address it. Now, it has become abundantly clear to the IMF that addressing systemic corruption is key not only for preventing crises, but also for resolving them. And in, in this evening, I want to explain to you in some detail why this is the case and what recommendations we have made as to how to address this problem. Now, a word about definitions. Lawyers love to talk about definitions. As, as Corrine has said, there are different definitions, but the one that is most widely accepted and is accepted by the IMF is that corruption is the abuse of public office for private gain. But this definition requires some discussion. First, what do we mean by abuse? Well, at a minimum, at a minimum, all countries understand that it includes criminal activity, most notably bribery and embezzlement. Embezzlement is a fancy legal word for theft. However, there are many who believe that it should include acts that are not just criminal, where the public interest is compromised by private interest. And this issue becomes particularly relevant with respect to political corruption, the funding of democracy, something that I will talk about. The second is, as Corrine has noted, the primary focus is on the abuse of public office for private gain. That means if you look at this term, it doesn't cover acts that are done exclusively within the private sector, right? Fraud in the private sector. The LIBOR scandal, for example. 
is private sector fraud. However, even if you focus on public office, the private sector is part of the problem. Why is that? Well, for every bribe that is accepted, one is offered by the private sector. So you cannot address the demand side of corruption without addressing the supply side. And at the IMF, even though purely private sector fraud is not considered as corruption, we do recognize that it can be extremely harmful. And in some respect, the greatest financial crisis that the world has suffered in the last 70 years, the one that existed in 2008, was in large part due to abuses within the financial services industry. So clearly, we have to look at those issues too. But let's start with the public sector. Let's start with the core. Now, I want to reiterate something that Corrine said, which is that every country experiences corruption. Denmark, which is ranked number one by Transparency International, there are always a handful of corrupt actors, even in Denmark. My focus today is in those countries where corruption is systemic, where it is not the exception to the norm, but where it is the norm of behavior, where it becomes the normal course of activity. Those are the countries that I'm focusing on, and unfortunately, there are a number of them. And in these cases, it has become clear that it effectively undermines the ability of the state to support the functioning of a market economy, which is why this topic fits perfectly in your discussion of capitalism. So let's look at some of the key state functions and how corruption undermines the effectiveness. So one of the most basic function of the state is its fiscal function, the capacity of the state to raise money through taxes and to spend it on critical services. Now, one can argue about the level of taxation, the type of services that would be provided. There's always a debate on that, but everybody would agree that there needs to be some revenue and some expenditure. And the problem is, is that when you have systemic corruption, the state's capacity to deliver this is undermined. Let's start with taxing. There are countries where systemic corruption exists where tax evasion is widespread, particularly amongst affluent professional classes, and where the tax authorities are complicit in this practice. Their salaries are in part augmented by their ability to provide tax breaks. And the problem with this is that the failure to pay taxes delegitimizes the entire tax system. If you're a taxi driver or a construction worker, why would you pay taxes when you know that the doctors and the lawyers are not? And of course, we know that widespread tax evasion can undermine fiscal sustainability and give rise to debt crisis. As you all know, this was one of the key causes for the crisis in Greece. But perhaps even more problematic than the taxing side is the expenditure side. How does it affect the capacity of the state to expend its money wisely? Well, first of all, there is the problem of waste, which occurs through corrupt practices in the procurement. Government officials will not necessarily get the best or cost-effective services, they might go to those that can give them kickbacks. 
But more fundamentally, it distorts the, the expenditure decisions. Instead of the state investing in health, in education, which everybody understands as being critical for sustainable growth, they will instead invest in infrastructure or conference centers because those conference centers are the investments that generate kickbacks and bribes. So it distorts the expenditure decisions. But that doesn't just undermine growth. It also exacerbates inequality because it is the poor segments of society that rely on the social services that are being starved because of these distortions. So let's look at another state function, basic state function. The state as a regulator. Again, one can argue about how much regulation should there be in the state. But there is a general recognition that the market economy needs to be supported by some minimal effective regulatory framework. However, when corruption is systemic, this framework can be abused in a number of ways. First, Government officials can demand bribes for, in exchange for licenses, for permits, and any type of approval that is needed, either for domestic investment or for foreign investment. This not only makes the investment more expensive, but more importantly, it creates uncertainty for the investor, and therefore may make the investor decide not to invest in the first place. When a foreign investor is decide, deciding to make a major capital investment in a corrupt country, he or she becomes aware that once that investment is made, he may become trapped into making future bribes to keep it operating. And that uncertainty can deter foreign investment. And you don't get any comfort by reaching an agreement with a corrupt official because you can't enforce that agreement. So the uncertainty that is created by corruption is a major disincentive for investment. And you know, there is this myth that business persons like a little bit of corruption. You know, they always say that the only thing worse than an inefficient corrupt government is an inefficient clean government. This is a myth. Almost all of the CEOs that I've spoken with believe that it is in their interest to have the predictability and uncertainty of what Corrine has spoken about, which is the rule of law. But there is a second way that systemic corruption can undermine the capacity of the state to regulate. And it is referred to as state capture. And here, the pressure is coming from the opposite direction, right? It's not coming anymore from the regulator asking for a bribe. It's coming from pr powerful private interests which compromise the ability of regulators to do their job by putting pressure and financial pressure on them. And this is, of course, evident for, during the Asian financial crisis. One of the reasons why there was excessive leverage in the financial system, why there was too much borrowing, was because the supervisors had been captured by large industrial groups and had been bribed to turn the other cheek. So you have to be aware that it, the pressure can come from both directions, and regulators can essentially be deprived of any capacity to do, to do their job. The examples I've given are from, naturally, because I tend to focus on this, in the economic and financial sphere. But the problem also arises tragically in other areas. For example, public safety. Think of the bribes paid by builders to building inspectors in Bangladesh that enable them to build factories with substandard materials and when these 
Some of these factories collapsed in 2013, killing over a thousand people, including many children. Now, all of this corruption that I've been referring to, this regulatory corruption, is ironically called petty corruption. To distinguish it from grand corruption, which is when heads of state steal money. But as you can see from the consequences, the economic consequences, the financial consequences, the social consequences, these are not petty outcomes. And what's tragic is that as corruption becomes embedded in society, the psychology of society, it can have a debilitating impact on attitudes particularly amongst the youth. The youth become incredibly cynical about their societies. And there is evidence that they are no longer interested in pursuing education. Why? Because in a corrupt society, it's not important what you know. What's important is who you know. So the interest in higher education is reduced as a result of this. And of course, it can also generate considerable political instability. In some respects, the Arab Spring was an expression of frustration against the elite who basically were shutting out large segments of society. So, how do we address this problem? Now, the natural reaction is to look for the magic bullet. That was certainly my impulse when I started working on this issue over 20 years ago. The problem is that this is a disease that requires action on a number of different fronts. As Einstein said, one should make solutions as simple as possible, but no simpler. The key point, though, I just want to make this point, the key point to understand that corruption is not a crime of passion. It's a crime of calculation. And therefore, what you need to do is to focus on how you change the incentives for this calculation. So, a key incentive for someone who is contemplating a corrupt act is the fear of going to jail. So a credible threat of prosecution is essential. The problem with this, however, is that this doesn't just require the adoption of a good criminal law. It requires the creation of institutions that have the capacity to apply that law. In this case, the police who investigate, the prosecutors who bring the charges, and of course, the courts who adjudicate. And the problem is, is that when corruption is systemic, these are the very, the very institutions that are the most corrupt. And my own experience is that any law is as weak as the weakest institution that has to enforce it. So, Institutional reform takes a lot of time. So one has to do this, but one has to realize that this can often be a long-term project. And not only is an effective prosecution difficult to establish, but I want to emphasize that if you focus exclusively on criminalization, this repressive dimension, it can also result in the abuse of an anti-corruption strategy for political purposes. We have seen how aggressive prosecutions occur by a government against their predecessors. So one has to be careful also about how you use the criminalization strategy. To ensure that an anti-corruption strategy is permanent, is embedded, and is not subject to the vagaries of the political process, I think there's a consensus about, amongst both academics 
and international organizations like the fund, that you need to look at a holistic approach of changing incentives that includes broader regulatory and administrative reform. And many of these reforms are not introduced only for corruption. They have broader benefits, but they do have a very important impact on corruption. Let's start with regulatory reform. In many cases, excessively complex and opaque approval procedures are, exist precisely to get bribes. The only reason they exist is to give officials the opportunity to get kickbacks. So naturally, the response is to deregulate. In India, for example, it requires over two dozen approvals to open a small retail store. These are there, obviously, because they provide the opportunity, as the economists would say, for rent-seeking activities. So, in many cases, deregulation has the broader benefit of generating economic activity and not just as an anti-corruption strategy. And in this respect, technology can also be very useful. Why? Because it eliminates the human transaction that often provides the basis for corrupt activity. When you are applying for a customs approval online, it makes it much more difficult for officials to demand bribes. But I want to emphasize that there are limits to the extent to which you can solve this issue by relying on deregulation and streamlining of regulation. We have learned in past crises that you do need to have a robust regulatory framework and that actually corruption can undermine that and you have to be able to basically have a civil service that can perform that capacity. A second area is transparency, which Corrine mentioned. Now, this is obvious, but I think it's important that we look at what we mean by this. Corruption, because it's criminal, is going to be hidden by definition. One of the ways to prevent it is to basically shine a light in the area. It will make it much more difficult for people to engage in corrupt acts. You know, sunshine is the best antiseptic. For example, one of the, we, we talked about grand corruption, where there is large-scale theft by government officials. One of the ways of preventing that is to demand fiscal transparency. In other words, trans, requiring governments to put all the transactions into the central budget, to publish it, and to have that subject to independent audits. Similarly, state-owned enterprises, which often play a very large role in natural resource economies where corruption is often systemic, should also be subject to strict rules on transparency and accountability. You know, actions in this area will depend on context. For example, I spent a lot of time in Indonesia where one of the biggest problems was corruption in, in, in the judiciary. And one of the steps that we took that had the greatest impact was introducing a requirement that judges publish the opinions that provide the basis for their decisions. It had a major impact because it made it much more difficult for them to deviate from the law or from precedent when making decisions. Now, it had other benefits as well, this transparency. But in the context of Indonesia, it was extremely helpful. So transparency is very contextual. Finally, administrative reform. What are we looking for? At the end of the day, you want to have a civil service that is proud of its independence from official interference or private influence. And how do you create that civil service? First, you have to look at salaries. 
In many societies, corruption is not an expression of greed. It's a means of survival. And it's important that basically public officials have a, a living wage. Secondly, it's really important that you have performance management systems that ensure meritocratic appointment and dismissal for non-performance. And these elements need to be combined. A country that introduced very effective corruption reform was Georgia. Some of you may know this. Georgia had a police force that was notoriously corrupt. Notoriously corrupt. So what the government did, first of all, they dismissed over 50% of the police force, but then increased the salary and introduced a rigorous performance management framework for those that were retained. And the corruption was eliminated or reduced significantly in a short amount of time. So we talk about incentives. Because prosecution can be very difficult, often countries who want to move quickly rely on dismissal as a, as a stick. So I've, I've identified a number of elements of an anti-corruption strategy. What I think is important is to, is to acknowledge that there are some generalizations that people make about dealing with corruption. And parts of these generalizations are true, and part of them, in my view, are myths. And I want to identify a few of them. The first is that systemic corruption is a function of culture, a prevailing culture, and that there are certain cultures that are simply more corrupt than others, and that no matter what you do, it's there. It's in, it's, it's in their blood. Now, part of this statement is true. Culture can be understand as embracing the concept of what social norms exist in a society. That's a way of describing what culture is. And as I've indicated, there are countries where the social norm is to be corrupt. But social norms change. Social norms change. And there are a number of examples of societies where corruption was, a, was the social norm and it changed. And a good example was the US, the 19th century civil service in the United States was one of the most corrupt civil services in the world. And over the course of the 19th century, as a result of demands from the private sector that they wanted basic, basic effective, and, and uh, clean civil, ser uh, civil services, it changed. Singapore was, prior to its independence, one of the most corrupt regions in Asia. And Lee Kuan Yew was able to eliminate it in a short amount of time. So cultures can change. Now, what is the catalyst for this change? We've talked about what needs to be done, regulatory reform, administrative reform, prosecution. But how do you, how do you get a country to give the political will to do it? In some cases, it happens as a result of a crisis, which leads to social and political realignment. This was the case in Indonesia, where I worked, where the financial crisis unleashed anti-corruption forces that had existed for a long time, and they seized the moment. And it helped unseat Suharto, and many of the anti-corruption institutions that exist in Indonesia now were established during that period. Indonesia still has problems, but relative to where it was 20 years ago, it's made a lot of progress. And leadership, of course, plays a critical role in providing a catalyst for change. Lee Kuan Yew is an example I've mentioned. There are others in Indonesia. Srimulyani, who was the Minister of Finance, came into power and dismissed her entire Customs Bureau. Now, another myth about corruption is that democracy is the most powerful anti-corruption force that exists. Now, 
In some cases, this is, the tr this is the case. Most notably, for example, in Indonesia. I just mentioned Indonesia, where the, st the establishment of democracy did play a critical role. But in other countries, such as India, the existence of democracy has not helped. It, it ex coexists with corruption in a very comfortable way. Indeed, in some countries, democracy will ex actually exacerbate corruption. I mentioned that during the 19th century, the US civil service was corrupt. You know why? There was a very specific reason for that. Political candidates would buy votes through promises of employment in the civil service. And this type of practice still goes on in a number of advanced and emerging market economies. And in the US, we no longer have necessarily a problem of politicians buying voters. There is a concern about voters buying politicians through the, the, the electoral finance system. Now, some people would say that that is a form of legalized corruption, but it has raised issues about this fundamental point about how the public interest can be compromised by private interest. At a minimum, it gives an increased amount of power in the electoral process by those who are wealthy. Now, until now, I have been talking about strategies that are directed at the countries where the problem exists. But over the years, there is an, a recognition that the problems in those countries are not entirely of their own making. Foreign investors from advanced and relatively corrupt free countries are often part of the problem. As I indicated, for every bribe that is accepted, one is given. And secondly, once the bribe has been given and taken, these public officials don't invest the proceeds of these crimes in their own countries. They send them overseas to financial institutions who are waiting to launder those funds. So this is a global problem that requires global solutions because private actors in advanced economies are facilitating both the supply but also the concealment of, of corrupt acts. Now, the good news is that actually many advanced economies are recognizing that they bear responsibility and have made commitments to limit the supply by criminalizing the offering of bribes to foreign officials. The OECD is the leader in this. As you know, the OECD is an international organization made up of advanced economies. And the Financial Action Task Force is another institution that addresses money laundering. Again, focusing on, in particularly, what they call politically exposed persons. That's the good news. The bad news is that enforcement of these treaties is extremely uneven. Enforcement is a problem everywhere. You may remember when the Panama Papers scandal came a couple of years ago, and there was a lot of scrutiny of these offshore companies and jurisdictions that allow for investors to set up shell companies where the true ownership is not revealed. And these were the proceeds of corruption. Well, as the OECD and as the Financial Action Task Force have said, one of the countries that has is the biggest offender in that in allowing for the concealment of the true owners is the United States. So it's important for us to understand the global responsibility in this area. I'm going to conclude with a point about practices exclusively within the private sector. Why should we care about this? What is the public interest in us regulating the way private actors deceive, this, de deceive each other? Why should we care? Well, the answer is look at the financial crisis 10 years ago. That's the answer. There is no doubt that the financial crisis was caused at least in part 
by unethical practices within the financial services industry. And the problem was not just fraud. It wasn't just fraud. I, uh, I was uh, um, on a panel a couple of years ago at the IMF, and one of the participants was Archbishop Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the UK. And the point that he made is that when you are in a position of power, as many of these senior people in the financial services industry are, where your actions, your acts of recklessness, of taking risks without protection, if they go wrong, can affect many people because of the effect on the broader economy. That is an unethical risk. So what do we do about this? As with the public sector, you have to look at the incentive structure. And actually, quite a lot of progress has been made. As you know, since the financial crisis, there have been changes to the capital rules, the supervisory rules, to actually try to reduce the ability of private institutions to take excessive risk, including modifying the way in which people are compensated and clawing back money if, in fact, it turns out that these were unethical acts. But in terms of criminal enforcement, the problem has been mixed. Yes, as you all know, you probably have read, there's been many high-profile penalties given to financial institutions for fraud. The problem is, is that there have been very few prosecutions against individuals. And if you limit it to criminal liability in the companies, the companies will just view it as a cost of doing business. Now, I'm the first to understand that establishing criminal liability of an individual acting in a group is not easy. But we have to be aware that it's not obvious that just having the company pay the price is necessarily a satisfactory solution. And there is a larger issue here. And this is the final point I'll make. And this is relevant to a strategy for the private sector and the public sector. If we place exclusive reliance on regulations and rules, you will just simply invite circumvention. And because what we need is not a culture of compliance, but a culture of values. What we want are public officials and private officials who do the right thing even though no one's watching. That's what we want. So how do we achieve this? My own view is that education plays a very large role. Increasingly, in institutions of higher education, including business schools, have made ethics a mandatory part of their curriculum. At Georgetown Business School, I have been co-teaching a course that emphasizes how actually a regular practice of meditation can actually enhance the ability of executives to see their work as an expression of service rather than just an extension of their ego. And as Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, has pointed out, business leaders need to avoid compartmentalizing their lives. So they have their their personal lives where there's an ethical framework and then they have their business life as separate. They need to begin to see their professional work as being a contribution to societal goals. And Adam Smith would have understood this completely. Although he is known as the father of laissez-faire economics and the invisible hand of the market, he also understood economics as being an extension of moral philosophy. The market would only work effectively if it was underpinned, as Corrine has said, by trust. The famous baker that is featured in The Wealth of Nations would only be able to sell his bread to the butcher if the butcher trusted him. Indeed, the Latin word for the word credit is credere, to trust. At the height of the financial crisis, you may remember this, when the interbank market was frozen and counterparties could not get liquidity, it was because the institutions could no longer trust 
the value of the products. So the evaporation of trust does not just create financial instability, but also political instability. Traditional institutions, both within the public and the private sector, are under attack because they are no longer trusted to act in the broader interest. The elites are perceived to be only interested in looking after themselves. And these institutions, in order to be preserved, and I do believe they need to be preserved, not destroyed, need to be reformed. And the point I would like you to take away is that the reform requires not just a changing in the rules, but also requires a shift in individual values. Thank you very much.